Uh, I'll start with some motivation uh, about uh, why we are releasing a data set of Wikipedia infobox attributes with all the, he the with all the edit history. Uh, Wikipedia infoboxes, as you probably know, they are fixed format tables that appear in the Wikipedia entries, usually at the top right hand side corner of the entries or the sections. They help in providing consistency to entities of the similar types, so different scientists will have an infobox of type scientist containing the same kind of data, different cities will contain an infobox of type city containing the same kind of data, and so on. And the data that is contained in the infobox includes facts and statistics about, about that type. And sometimes it also summarizes salient points that are also mentioned in the article. So infoboxes are by nature designed to be uh, <coughs> to, to repeat information that should appear in the main entry as well if it's relevant about the entity being defined. <coughs> this is an example. This is a Wikipedia entry page about the King County uh, in, in Washington, in the state of Washington in the US. So you see that you have in the main part of the entry, you have the normal Wikipedia entry and then you have an info box at the right hand side containing information. If it's a city, it will contain information such as the uh, symbols of the city, its location in a map, and typical information, the population, the area, the major, and so on. Uh, so, uh, because infoboxes are semi-structured, as you can see, uh, they don't follow a, a really rigid uh, schema, but they, they have some common, uh, info, the, temp the infoboxes of the same type, they have some common uh, structure, so we, we could consider them to be semi-structured and definitely much easier to process than the main entries. Uh, so and therefore, uh, and they are also widely available, they are open access, access, anyone can extract them from the Wikipedia pages and this has facilitated the use of infoboxes for many applications. These are just a few examples <coughs> for knowledge based construction. Uh, knowledge bases like DBpedia or Freebase, they take much information from Wikipedia infoboxes. Uh, it's also been applied for document summarization to understand what is the most relevant information about, en about entities. If they are relevant enough to appear in the infobox, maybe they are relevant enough to appear in summaries as well. Also for relation extraction or for uh, inf information extraction in general for applying distance supervision methods. Uh, from the infoboxes you can extract a knowledge base about uh, attribute value pairs or related entities and then you can try to identify appearances of the related entities and the relation type in text, either in the main Wikipedia entry or in random text on the web, and try to learn patterns for extracting new information. <coughs> so with the example of the page before, uh, you can see that in the info box, one of the attributes was when that county was founded in 1852. So then you can also find the sentence in the main entry text that contains the same date and uh, if it should, uh, that should be pretty strong evidence that that sentence is probably conveying the, the meaning that the attribute is conveying. So it's, it's mentioning that uh, the sentence is also mentioned in the founding date for the county. So it should be possible if you have a training set quite large extracted from the whole Wikipedia uh, with uh, occurrences of entities and attribute values, it should be possible to extract positive examples and train classifiers to be able to say, okay, if we have, for example, the, the pattern, the county was formed uh, on and then you have a date and you know that the county is co-referenced to the entry that is being defined here, so then you should be able to extract from a sentence like that the value of that attribute and to extract it from other counties for which we may not have it in a structured format. So, <coughs> uh, also, uh, every Wikipedia page, you also know this, uh, has an associated page history where you can see all the different changes that have happened to the page. You can view and compare past versions and you can revert the current entry to one of them. Uh, and uh, in particular, Having the historical values of all the infobox entries 
could have many applications. So it would uh, give us a historical overview of how of the change affecting the entries, uh, focus on this semi-structure nature of the infobox data. So you could see, for example, how populations of countries increase over time. You could see how revenue of companies change over time or number of employees. You have a lot, a, a really a wealth of information there that for Wikipedia it has already been available for seven, eight years at least. And it, it should be quite useful to have it available in an easier to process format. It could be used, I mentioned distance supervision before for extracting information from text. So it should be used also, it should be useful also to extract information from temporally changing attributes. So if we find a document that mentions an entity Let's suppose you find a document with a country name and it contains also in the same sentence a number that is exactly the population of that country five years ago. You can also, and the document is from five years ago, you can use all this information to consider that a positive example for distance supervision as well to, to increase your data set. And uh, another interesting application of this is to be able to analyze which attributes are more likely to change over time and to attract user interest so as to, uh, to be updated in Wikipedia. <coughs> so, uh, for, all, for all these reasons, we are releasing these data sets uh, together with Wikimedia Deutschland. And uh, the, in this data set, we are providing all the historical updates, all the edit history updates to Wikipedia infoboxes. So, for each entry, you could imagine it as a set of tu tuples where the most important information is uh, the timestamp when a change happened, the infobox type, the attribute that is being changed, what was the old value, and to, uh, what is the new value of the attribute. To, to give it more specifically, uh, this, is a, um, this is a fragment of the release data set. It's uh, formatted in JSON. So you find information like this. So this is one entry, and it says uh, for the entry France, uh, there is, uh, you have a list of attributes that we've seen in all the edit history versions of Wikipedia about France, and for each one you, you have information like this for France, at this timestamp, uh, with some contributor name or IP, uh, this is the infobox key, so this is the gross domestic product of France. This is the value that this user entered at this timestamp. Uh, the infobox that is being updated with one, one new value is infobox country. This is the Wikipedia ID of the change and the user comments. And uh, you also have at the same timestamp, in the same revision, they also added the year for which that GDP value or estimate is valid. And then if you go down in the, on in the list of changes of France, later on you will find that the GDP of France with the same attribute key has increased to 1.8 trillion. And the year in which this value applies is 2005. And it was a different user who changed it and, uh, and so on. <coughs> So this is the, the architecture of the system. We didn't have full access to the Wikipedia database. What we did, uh, we downloaded the latest edit history dump that was available when we started working on this, which was uh, from early 2010. Uh, and that, that was a, a huge file uh, with like three or five terabytes compressed that you had to, in, to increase to, to, to decompress to a single file of around 50 terabytes, a single XML file. Um, so this, this was mostly an engineering work of being able to, to process the file, to understand the Wikimedia markup. And uh, that gave us a state of all the changes that have happened until, that, that, until this dump. So from January 2010 onwards, what we did was to to build a client for the Wikimedia API, to be able to crawl all the page changes that were happening after that date. Uh, and, and so we, we store everything centralized in a, in a database that we have. Um, and then uh, once we have all, all of this stored, 
uh, to harvest the new, the new updates, so we pass the Wikimedia markup, we extract the info boxes, we compare the current revision with the previous revision, and we, we copy these changes into the database of the info box attributes, info box attribute updates. Uh, we also do some vandalism detection ourselves um, to, to try to remove the, the wrong examples and finally we generate the final output. <coughs> so this is, this is basically what I just described. We also do a simple cleaning. So uh, sometimes our Wikipedia markup parsing fails because it's not perfect. So if we find that there are new values that are too, too big, uh, it may be that we haven't properly detected the end of the info box and we have attached to the last attribute everything that comes afterwards in the main entry or it may be also that the user had made a mistake, uh, a markup mistake, so we remove the very, very large values in, in size and number of bytes. We remove also updates with a life of less than one minute and this is also to make the the data set more easily downloadable and usable because that reduces the size of the data set by to maybe between 10 and 20 percent the original size. So really the vast majority of updates are, are reverted quite quickly, we found. Uh, but there is no other cleaning or, or understanding. So we are releasing just the raw data. If the name of an attribute changes, we don't try to to relate it with the previous name, so we are just releasing that some attribute has disappeared and a new attribute has appeared again. We don't try to, to find them. And also we ignore the semantics <coughs> of the attributes. So the, the templates change over time, so for attributes like birth dates, in the earliest versions you would have the date written in a text format. At some point the, the template change and then the attribute for most entries is now provided in a, as, as a special template containing this data. Uh, so we are just providing the data that the user wrote uh, without, without understanding. So these are some statistics. So after the cleanup, uh, we have 39 million uh, attribute updates. This goes from the beginning of Wikipedia until uh, March 2012. There are around 2 million entries with at least one attribute and uh, we have 600,000 usernames and uh, around 2 million IP addresses that have contributed to the data that goes into this data set and 12,000, 13,000 different in attribute templates and the most common infobox types are things like settlement, album, film, music, local artists and French commune and this, <laughs> this was a, a bit surprising for us actually when we started working on this, working with that dump from 2010, I think French Commune was the top uh, infobox type that we found. And we saw that really uh, for every French Commune there was a Wikipedia page and contained the infobox. So probably someone starting from a structured data with a full list of French communes probably automated the creation of of all of these pages, most of them were stabs. Uh, just contain the name of the page and saying this is a stab about a, a French city. But then over time people have, keep, have kept improving them and adding more information. So I, I find that really interesting. And these are some attribute level statistics. So 16 million uh, attributes have numbers in values. Uh, there are uh, 300,000 hyperlinks to external pages and almost 10 million hyperlinks to other Wikipedia pages in the values. Uh, <coughs> and the, there is a significant number of locations and dates in values and then a little bit less measurements, times, currencies or time intervals. This is just an example I want to show to illustrate the kind of data that is here. So if you have the entry of France and the attribute precedent uh, around two, so the first time this, uh, this was added to the French entry was around 2006, so the value was, was Chirac. So if you uh, move forward in time, uh, over time there are a number of changes to this attribute, but mostly it's people extending uh, Okay, giving, giving more information about this value, so extending the name, indicating what is a political party, 
And then uh, at some point there were elections and you see that there is a lot of activity here because people are changing the value from Chirac to Sarkozy back to Chirac back to Sarkozy. And this is because as soon as the elections happened, people went to Wikipedia and they said, oh, the value is outdated. I'm going to be the one who is going to change this very irrelevant attribute of France and they change it. And then you have the Wikipedia editor coming back and saying, eh, thank you for doing the change but there is a new president elected but he hasn't taken office yet and it will happen in a few weeks and this this were happening over and over again for a few weeks until finally Sarkozy took office and then people stopped changing the attribute you just have a few changes there in between at some point people change it maybe to Carla Bruni in one of the spikes there uh, but then these are kind of things that are reverted quickly then you have a big spike there People were changing the value to Philippe Petain, who is a French general from... Uh, and it, it was just one user who tried to change it like nine or ten times, and it was always reverted very quickly until my assumption is that the user was banned eventually. <laughs> and it, it went back to Sarkozy, and, and this, is, this is the kind of things that you have seen. We've also tried vandalism detection. Uh, because we have, re we have released this data set without a full entry. So we want to know if people have this data set, will, be, will they be able to identify vandalic edits without having the full entry? So we try to train a classifier with, with pretty uh, standard features, <coughs> lexical features, if the change is adding sex words or insults or was like nasty, things like that. Uh, if it's a bot initiated entry, uh, edits, if it's a user IP or IP address, so the, these kind of things. And we've seen that using just these features only on the Infobox data, we can obtain a state of real results in vandalism detection compared to people using full text vandalism detection, which is, which is quite nice. Uh, this is just another example for, this is for country population. Uh, over time, from 2005 until 2009, uh, you can see that uh, if you take the list of countries from the World Bank, by, by 2009, already 100% of the countries have a population attribute. And are, uh, more than 90% of them uh, have this value updated yearly. And if you compare these values with the values provided by the World Bank, the error rate of the Wikipedia attributes is only between 2 and 3 percent and most of the cases is just that the user rounded out the number to provide the, just an exact number of millions instead of the full number. So this is, this is also quite nice. So other thing that we ask ourselves is how fresh is this data? When something changes, how long people take to update it in Wikipedia? Okay, uh, if the value of some attribute changes, to know how long people took to update it in Wikipedia, we, we need to know for that attribute when it started being valued. Like in the example of Sarkozy and Chirac before, that's something that <coughs> might not be obvious and, and it might be different for each attribute type. So how can we do a study like this uh, more uh, in a fully automatic way? So what we thought is that we could analyze the attributes whose value is a date. Things like date of death of a person, date of first aired for a movie on TV, a film release date on the cinema, things like that. So if the attribute value is a date, we can, s uh, well, the first time we see the attribute value, we know exactly when that started being valid and we can see how long it took for it to be added to Wikipedia. And this is some uh, interesting <coughs> statistics that we can also learn from here. So for the um, attributes whose value is a date, 20% of them are updated within the day, which is uh, quite fast in my opinion. But there is also a very long tail. Uh, for 90% of the dates to be added to Wikipedia, it takes around three years. For deaths of people, they usually, uh, half of them, the median is in, in a couple of days. So a couple of days after someone dies, you have 50% chance of seeing it in Wikipedia, but for scientists it takes 31 days to reach this 50%. 40% of military conflicts are added in the first couple of days. Uh, for TV shows, you have the date of, uh, if you look at the airing date of the last episode, it's much, much faster to be added to Wikipedia than the first episode. So for the last episode, there is more momentum, more followers, probably, so uh, within nine days you have half of them in Wikipedia 
the airing date of the first episode, it takes 106 days to be added. And uh, for many things it takes much longer actually. Things like company revenue, since they report it until it is added to Wikipedia, it, it can take between a third and a half of a year. So just to finish, uh, so this is a dataset we're releasing together with Wikimedia Deutschland. Uh, the purpose is that uh, when we started working on this, it was really, really hard to, to have this data available because it was really hard to, to work with the full Wikipedia history of edits. Uh, so we are, uh, the data we are releasing, it's only, I think, between three and five gigs compressed. Yeah. If you download it and decompress it, it's about 50 gigs. So it's, it's something that everyone can process nowadays with a single machine. Um, we're making it available in the tool server page and we expect this to be useful for research from information extraction uh, and natural language processing to maybe also sociology and analysis of how people collaborate. And as future work, we plan to publish updates over time of the same data set and we would like to extend to other languages but this is uh, done in, uh, this is our hobby, so it is done in our free time. It's not our main work, so uh, we don't want to make any commitments at the moment, but the plan is, is definitely to, to keep updating this, for sure. Thank you. This one, this yeah. one. So, so, this one. so, what we have here is that after cleanup, it's only 40 million. So, this means the cleanup of the long attributes and then underwater. And the, right, oh. that's all, yes. And you get rid of a, a lot of it, yes. Changes. Yes. <laughs> so, it, it may be also that, um, that uh, our Wikimedia markup and uh, interpretation, uh, so we've iterated a lot on that, we believe it's not so bad, but there are uh, cases where we know that it's making a mistake. And if it's making a mistake, it might believe that there are many more attributes that there really are. So I'm not completely sure how, how reliable the full data set numbers are. It might also be a, an artifact of a markup analysis mistakes and things like that. But yes, we, we saw that there is a, that the data set is reduced by a lot. We, we tried several of them, finally we chose another boost classifier, but we tried SVM and we tried decision trees and there wasn't really a big difference between and them. Adaboost. What? Sorry? Adaboost. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to make a remark, so I think it was very interesting presentation, thank you. And I just want to link to your presentation yesterday. And I think this presentation shows how useful the data is, because uh, on, for, I, I think the last slide shows uh, how up-to-date mm -hmm. uh, the information in the info boxes are. And you could see uh, in, in the future, you, you can uh, have this information, or you have this information, or up to the information are. So right. So you're just going to leave the work. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Don't think it's a surprise that both works come from the same European project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a good point, and I think a lot of this will be unnecessary once we have Wiki, Wikidata. Yeah. And a lot of the thing we've done will be much simplified. So internationalization is, is evident, it, it will be trivial once uh, all the different languages are linked to the same data set. Um, and you, you also, you're also keeping all the edit histories as well. There's one more question. Yeah, so a quick one. Uh, so since you have focused on info boxes, uh, I wonder if you have also uh, tried to make uh, 
that you explored a speci other special fields uh, such as, for instance, in medicine, the codes that uh, uh, some editors are introducing to, to mark the type of diseases in medical databases and, mm -hmm. and so forth, because that's interesting information that, uh, for instance, in collaborations with uh, experts in medicine or pharmacology, it's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they are valuable attributes that, that could be added. But I, I wonder if you have some, some data about it. Uh, well, we have we have all the crawl of Wikipedia, so we have all the historical data. We're only releasing info boxes, but there is other kind of similar data that is useful. We can we can consider adding it to the distribution. So, any further questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Yes, this one. Just a quick one. It's only uh, English. Uh, English. Uh, right now, it's in English. Yes. Other questions? I would have one. Um, so the freshness of the data um, certainly had a very long tenure. I think. Um, what I would be interested in, just in case you maybe did look at this data, is is the freshness kind of like language dependent or other stuff that's more interested to. English editors up here faster, like English scientists, English musicians, instead of Chinese uh, musicians and uh, German scientists. Like this. Do you have a feeling about this kind of data? Well, in general, the more people are interested in, so the, in, in an entry, the more changes you see for the entry and the fresher the changes are. So, because we're working with English, I would expect uh, that there will be more English entities that have a big following base that are willing to make these changes quickly. So I think that should happen. I haven't looked at the data. Um, there's one more question here. Uh, could you detect some kind of if it works in the if it works? Uh, any kind of? If it works. If it works. Yeah, so uh, we, we have many Many, many examples, like, like the one I showed with Philippe Petain and Sarkozy, we have many examples of but suddenly there, there is a burst. During a long time. Like or long time. Uh, we haven't looked into long time things, but they, they should be in the data set, yes. Okay. So basically, you can download the data yourself now. It's available in the and it is providing a much easier to task than the whole Wikipedia and we go ahead and actually try to discover long-term edit wars. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So we, we don't have so much time to work with this ourselves, so we'll be really happy if people start downloading it and applying to, to other applications that we never thought of. So there's a really interesting data set you can work with now. Um, have you thought about resupplying the data to Wikipedia? I mean, for example, if you have GDP data, it would be nice to uh, be able to construct an in, in infobox box with the historical data of GDP that is already there, has been for Wikipedia. Uh, uh, yeah, that's an, an intriguing proposal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Okay, we're back. So the name of this talk is Creating Ontologies from Wikipedia, Union Experience. And Union is a project that takes archives from the Great War and tries to create databases of the events of the Great War. Now, before I start, I have a few announcements. Uh, HAL has a new branch office, and it's in JFK Airport in New York. If you plan on traveling any time this summer, I strongly advise that you go anywhere but there. Spend the money, you'll be happier. That's all I can say. Similarly, all airlines are to spawn of the devil. And I'd just like to make a suggestion. If we do this again, we should make it in winter. There'll be less tourists, and we can go skiing in the afternoon. That's just my two cents. Feel free to ignore me. So that in this talk, I'm just going to start talking a little bit about the ontology, what we do with it, and then I'll go back to Wikipedia. I just, I'm not going to toot my horn, I just want to motivate what I'm doing and how it relates to Wikipedia. So the problem of the First World War is that it happened 100 years ago, and it's historical data. So the people, the events, 
the countries and the organizations that happened are no longer current. And a lot of the ontologies that we already have are meant for to deal with the current present and current facts. And it turns out it's a real problem to actually talk about facts or events that, act, that happened in the past because they're no longer current, they're no longer through. So the ontology talks about organizations, people, and the relationships in between them. And it's basically a very large taxonomy and, that relates concepts in, diff, with, in different sca time scales with different relationships. So my current bias is with Canada and the British Empire. That's not because Canada and the British Empire were the only people involved in the First World War. It's just that that's the data that I have right now and I'm drowning in it. So as I catch up with my breath and I actually process as much data as possible, I'll start moving on to other countries. Uh, second thing is that most people who do ontologies will actually sit down and write an ontology and declare it to be working and everything is fine. The way I create the ontology is as I acquire more data and the data does not fit within the ontology, I will create new concepts to fit the data within it. It's just that I can't really sit down and create all the concepts that could possibly occur within a war because it's too complex of a topic. So the major problem is that words mean different things to different people. So in Canada, militia is a reservist unit that dates back to New France. In the United States, a militia is a bunch of crazy people with guns. So you can imagine when the United States and Canada have joint exercises, they occasionally have misunderstandings. Second, uh, another example is a corpse. A corpse can be a military unit that's administrative in nature, like an ambulance corps, or it can be an actual maneuver unit that contains brigades. Ironically, the Wikipedia page on disambiguation does not differentiate the two. It just disambiguates the fact that it could be a military term or a corpse of three. So perhaps we should fix that at some point. So one thing that's already been mentioned is that there are things and then the names of the things. And if you're using multiple languages, you need a pointer to the thing and then pointers to the names of the things in different cultures and different languages. And that's one of the major things that an ontology is good at. So we can talk about a sergeant or a Feldwebel and have the term in English or in German. But then we have the term for the actual rank that those two things represent. And so we can reference the same element within the universe even though we have two different, different cultures. And yes, there has been a lot of criticism of the semantic web. The two things that are working very well at the moment is the fact that you can put a URI on something and we can all point to that URI in order to reference the same thing and we don't have any arguments about what the URI is. The, cent the second thing that it does very well is that we can encode the fact that our URI and that URI are the same thing or that they are not the same thing. And this turns out to be very useful to do some uh, data exchange. Uh, so for example, here's the Battle of Regina Trench from the Canadian perspective. I just have two regiments here, the Royal Canadian Regiment and the P P Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. That's about 2,000 men, and each regiment is now down to 100 people, which tells you how poorly things are going. There used to be a major in command, he's dead. The captain took over, he's dead. And Lieutenant B B Bidolf is now dead. And there is a junior lieutenant in charge. Things are not going well. But this is just to give you an idea of what the complexity of the modeling is. And now keep in mind that you double this and you have the Saarbrücken regiment on the other side that has exactly more or less the same structure. So that's an re unreasonable amount of relationships and objects and classes that are being modeled. And the sort of data I'm dealing with is, for example, this one, which is actually Australian data. And what you can extract from a lot of these archives is, for example, here, this is about, about Captain Boddington. And he's, he's saying, my mate Private Gleason, or excuse me, this is Private Wood talking about Private Gleason. My mate Private Gleason. So now you can say Private Wood and Private Gleason are friends. And you can go through this archives and generate the Facebook of 100 years ago because Gleason and, and Wood are friends, which is pretty neat. Or there's a lot of forgotten history. So for example, Private Cooper got his commission two days before he went in that time. He's now dead. 
the person that promoted it gave him his, his commission is dead, and it's never recorded. So if you look it up in your official books, it's still Private Gleason. In, actuali in actuality, he was Lieutenant, sorry, Cooper. He's been promoted. And just some of the initial uh, research that's been done, which gives interesting results. This is a project I was working on with Shelley Hulan in English. So if you look at the dispatches done on a military battlefield and people in trenches, and you start counting the, the sentences and the length of sentences, it turns out that people that are getting shot at write longer messages than people who aren't, which was a little bit interesting because I expected it to be backwards. But the more people are under stress, the more they'll spend time writing detailed messages so that nobody actually mistakens what they're trying to tell you. So back to Wikipedia. The, we all know that the languages are unequal and English dominates. And not, not all pages are translated in other languages. And if you're trying to build an ontology in different languages, that's a problem because you can find the thing, but you cannot find necessarily the labels for, the same, for that particular thing in whatever language you're using. There's also a bias in Wikipedia in that it's an encyclopedia. So everybody wants the information within the encyclopedia, encyclopedia to be up to date. And there's a knee-jerk reaction to say, this is historic data, therefore it's not up to date, so it shouldn't be in there. So every so often you'll have these minor edit wars because somebody tries to put in a paragraph that says, this is what happened. And somebody will try and remove it by saying, no, it's not relevant. This is what's actually going on right now. And that makes, it turns out, the, ref the referencing of some of the content Wikip within Wikipedia to get a, a bit complicated. And lastly, it's unstable stable content in that anybody can change it. Now, I'm trying to make Wikipedia do something that it was never meant to do, is I'm trying to turn it into a knowledge base. And if you have a system that's a knowledge base and anybody can change it, there are major consequences. So for example, in the OpenStreetMap, if you read the mailing list, you're aware that every so often somebody makes a mistake and that Poland gets flooded overnight. That's a minor thing to fix. If you have a GPS unit that's trying to use that data to get you through Poland, you have a problem. So it's, there are certain, there's a certain dampening that you need to use when you're actually pulling in information from Wikipedia into a knowledge base and you probably want to do it as a batch, curate that knowledge and not, then not necessarily change it just because you don't want Poland to flood overnight in your knowledge base. So when we get data from Wikipedia, we've tried to keep it as simple as possible. There have been other attempts at using sophisticated natural language processing to get data from the, at the actual text in a page. I have shied away from that just because it's fairly difficult to, on a scale, to do that properly. And at the same time, I want to reference Wikipedia when I make a decision or I make a knowledge decision. So what I've done is I've queried a lot of the category data. I've queried DBpedia also to try and pull in objects. And from time to time, I make different decisions on what is the easiest way to get the data out of Wikipedia. And somebody mentioned list pages the other day. The problem with list pages is that it's a page of, of links. And the only way that I, can that I can link to Wikipedia right now is through DBpedia. So while it's easy for me to write a script that just goes through that data and orders uh, knowledge decisions based on the contents of that page, it's fairly difficult for me to reference something that's in the middle of a paragraph from just from a language perspective. So I try to avoid list pages because it means I have to write a unique script for that specific pages. Although I was curious to learn about that cross terracing warriors page, which I'm not quite sure if it's going to make it into ontology, but it's actually interesting. And lastly, there's the problem with the ontology is that it needs to deal with changes. So countries come and go, you know, revolutions happen, people get invaded, and that's the fact of life. And a country is fundamentally a political entity that changes. And then the, its physical borders change, and its government changes. And you can't even keep, you really use the population as a good, a good indicator because people migrate. And you'll notice that that's why the UNAMES ontology does not actually really reference countries. It just said a populated place. 
because it's the people that live there that give it, gave it its name. So on top of this, you have this second level of interaction, which is what do the people call it and what do the people from their perspective call it? So Canada is spelt with a C in English, Canada is spelt with a K in German. It's the same thing, but two labels, two perspectives on the same thing. So this is the typical type of object that I'm interested in. The German Empire, it's no longer around, but it's one of the major players within the First World War. And it has a start and an end date, and makes it really easy to generate this object that says it started here, it ended here, and the organization is no longer around. Also, there's the template that's, that has predecessor and successor in terms of the, the countries that made up the German Empire and what the pieces of the German Empire ended up being. To m from my perspective, this is the most important feature of Wikipedia. And if you top this one up, I will buy you a lot of pitchers of beer. Because that is so useful from my perspective because it tells me, or at least it gives me a hint to say, what are the cultures that made up the German Empire? Where, the, where did the culture of the German Empire go into new countries? Where should I look for, for the boundaries of the physical locations of the German Empire? And what, are the, what countries, uh, sorry, got invaded to make up the, the, the German Empire or that joined together to make the, the German Empire? So this is pretty cool because then you can say, well, I have the Maison Nerve Regiment where does, where does that come from? And then you say, okay, it comes, back, it comes from New France, which goes to France. So now you can make linkages in where the culture comes from over time in between the different organizations. Similarly, here's a problem. Canada. Quick question. When did Canada get its con constitution? 1982. When did Canada get political independence, grossly? 1938. The Canada in 1916 is no longer the Canada that is in 2012. In 1916, it did not have really a choice in its, its, in its decision. It's not a colony, it's actually a dominion. And so if Great Britain says, thou shall do this, that's what Canada did. So if you're trying to study chains of command, if you're trying to study intent of what people are doing, you can't really use these two, this particular instance for Canada in the concept of the Great War because it does no longer represents the, A, the culture, B, the level of government, and actually in C, it doesn't even represent the boundaries of the country in 1916 because it acquired a, a, a number of British holdings. And in 1949, it actually merges with the, or acquires the Dominion of Newfoundland. So, Ironically, if you talk to a Newfoundlander today about the First World War, his perspective is that they are an independent country because they made their own decision to go to the Second, for, for, uh, the Second World War. They made their own decision to go to the First World War. And if you would have met a Newfoundlander in the First World War, he would have been really upset at you if you were to call him Canadian. S similarly for China, it's interesting that it's the public Re People's Republic of China, which has been around since 1949. You can take about, talk about the China as in the place, China as the people, but right now it's being linked to the political entity. So from our, from our perspective, this is a problem too. And interestingly, what we can do is you can use an actual linked open data construct that says different from. So in terms of uh, Canada and China, what I actually do is redefine my objects and say they're different from this because this is not what I'm referencing within my, my universe. So there are certain things that I was looking w w uh, in Wikipedia for, and one of them is the concept of a historical period. So a historical period would be the Victorian era, the Ed Edwardian era, the Warren States era. And it turns out that there's an info box out there that's called ERA for, for history purposes. And it's been hijacked for Star Wars. Okay. Look, it makes perfect sense if you're writing a bunch of Wikipedia articles about Star Wars. From my perspective, that's not the object type I want. So I, there's a lot of human curation involved in that. The important events is relative, again, to their, your viewpoint. 
So there's, when I showed you that very large, complicated model of the RCR and the PPCLI, that's during the Battle of the Regina Trench. That's actually a smaller part of the Battle of the Somme. If you're a Canadian, the Re Battle of Regina Trench is very important. But most historians will talk about the Battle of the Sun as being more important. So there's a difference in perspective. Interestingly, if you're the get person getting shot at, it's a battle. Uh, and one thing I'd like to talk about at length, just because it's really complicated, is military ranks. So I might talk about a sergeant. And that's, generically, that means something to everybody here. But a different army, is a sergeant, means different things because they have different responsibilities. They also have very large, very different pay grades, which means a lot to the person getting paid. It also means, it can, it also means difference, differences about where they are. So if I talk about a sergeant, it's fairly generic. If I talk about a flight sergeant, it's a sergeant, but it means you're in your force also. If I talk about a Havildar, you're a sergeant, but you're in the British Army, or sorry, the British India Army, or you're in the Pakistani Army, or you're in the Indian Army. Or there's a British Army sergeant, which obviously means you're in the British, you're in the British Army. You could talk about a German sergeant, a Feldweld, or you're a sergeant with a J, and which means one of two things. One, you're in a very, very, very old British unit that still uses that archaic spelling, or it means you're in the First World War. So just for the name, you have this entire construct of possibilities that expands with it. And that's why the ontology is as complicated as possible in that you can use this to actually parse text after a while. And you can say, well, if there's a Wilder in his sentence, so you activate all of these concepts that says, I'm in either in this historical period of the British Indian Army, or I'm in the modern period of Pakistan and India. And again, the instances of the same rank are never the same thing. So yes, there's this top level object that says sergeant, but there's this, this entire taxonomy underneath it that says it might be this one or might be that one or might be this one. Uh, so go back again, this is the case of the Hevilder. And this article is actually annoying to work with because there's a lot of things going on here. So it originates from the Maharata Empire and then it trickles down to the British Indian Army, and then it goes down to Indian and Pakistan Army. And this is where it becomes interesting in that the culture derives from one place to another. So if you're working with this concept, you can link to Wilder. Now the question is, how do you extract from Wikipedia where it's being used? And you can use this category data of military ranks of, of India, military ranks, ranks of Pakistan. Military ranks of the British Indian Army is missing here. And so if you, uh, I added it because I knew of it, but strictly from a query perspective, you're missing some information. And this is, this is a plot of what the ontology actually does. So there's this top level rank that says sergeant, and then it just percolates into these bizarre uh, al uh, alternate or specific items of this rank. What's interesting is that a lot of the properties aren't necessarily transitive. So if you say a sergeant and you're a British Indian Army, you're actually junior to a British Army sergeant. But you're the equivalent to a sergeant in the Pakistan or the Indian Army, which is ironically equivalent to a British Indian sergeant. So a lot of times it's, it's inconsistent, and that's because there's a lot of historical items to it. There's some bugs in the Wikipedia category system. Some bugs, some bugs. So for example, I was trying these queries on the category systems and I was trying to get the military ranks of Germany using the English page, which does not map properly to the, Germ to the German language page because it's actually the ranks of the Budenwill, excuse me, the Budenwill. And if you actually go to the super category of th that particular category, you get the Deutschland Dienstgrad which actually translates back directly to military ranks of Germany. So occasionally there's these little bugs where you actually have to redo the query using the labels in the other language just to try and find the original page that you're looking for and actually identify that rank. So it turns out that you can use the DBpedia 
but a lot of times it's used better to use a hybrid of DTPedia and the original Wikipedia language to actually get things done. Uh, similarly, if you try and list the Canadian Army ranks, you, cannot, you can get all the way to the category of Canadian Army. Sadly, there's no way to figure out the fact that the Canadian Army is the Army of Canada as an object, which somewhat makes querying Wikipedia a bit complicated. Uh, templates are great to get uh, data. However, the problem with templates is that in many cases they're actually made to look to make things look good, which is very different from saying, from having some kind of semantic meaning to the templates. So there's this wonderful list of pages that are comparative ranks of different armies, and I have been trying to get data out of it. However, it's essentially parsing HTML, and what makes sense to looking good does not make sense in terms of from a semantic perspective. Uh, so lastly, I, as, as I mentioned, somebody mentioned the other day that they had a problem with linking to different versions of DDpedia, different versions of Wikipedia. I have a stop the gap measure it's where I mark my ontologies with a specific version of the page that I was interested in when I generated that. And that's at least allow somebody reading the ontology to make sense of whether or not the current page, the, their current longhand description that they're looking at on Wikipedia is exactly what I had in mind when I created that particular instance. So if you're creating an ontology, Wikipedia, Wikipedia is an outstanding resource to get raw data. It requires a little bit of massaging, but it, the, the, the value of the information outweighs the, the work that you'll work on it that you'll do on it. Um, the question that I'd like to talk to ask uh, tr from a lot of people here is, I'm cleaning a lot of this, this information. It's slowly getting linked to other data sets. And ontologies and a lot of the linked open data world will be generating a lot more facts and linkages. Is there a way that we can look at to reintroduce into Wikipedia a lot of this clean data and a lot of this linked data? So from a perspective, we were able to generate a lot more category linkages without necessarily having somebody sit at the computer and to do it. The downside is that when you do 100,000 inserts on a, on a category, maybe you want to look at very carefully what you're doing. So this is the end of my talk. If you have any questions, that would be a great time. It's, it's related to the info boxes in that not all info boxes make it into DDpedia. And there are a lot of point items where I want that particular piece of the info box, and so I'm, I extract it myself. A lot of the cleaning has to do with much more the linkages in between the different pieces. So a flight sergeant does not reference the flight sergeant page, uh, sorry, the sergeant page. And so I create that within the ontology. Maybe we should look at creating a linkages between those two pages within Wikipedia but it's much more, it's very targeted to what I want to do instead of a lot of the Wikipedia projects which are gen uh, generalized as possible. Any other questions? I'll just shoot the second one afterwards. Um, the, sorry, sorry. Um, right, so for creating an ontology of brands in different armies, um, I'm trying to to mine it out of Wikipedia text. I'm wondering if there are that many ranks that you actually would make sense just to do it by hand after reading the article. I mean, for the battles and so on, I see the point because there's a lot of data that you want to get out. But for the ranks, are there so many that actually doing the automatic thing 
So just from the Commonwealth War, war Graves data set, there's about 4,000 ranks. That's the loosely coupled English speaking world. So no, I'm not doing it by hand. Okay. And I wasn't aware about that many things. Okay. Questions? So then let's thank the speaker again. Um, my name is Fabian Flack. My name is Fabian Flack from the Culture Institute of Technology, as you heard. This is some work I did together with a student of mine um, who did the actual implementation, Andrei Rochenko, who's not here today. And actually the work was started uh, with Danny as a supervisor as well before he moved to Wikimedia. And it's called Whose Article Is It Anyway? Detecting Authorship Distribution Over Time with Wikigini. Really long title. Um, so there are three components to this talk. Um, the first one, who is Whose Article Is It Anyway? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's reflecting, the, it's, it's um, referencing the authorship. So not ownership in the sense that somebody owns an article because it's not allowed and should not be, but who authored most, most of it. Distribution, how it's uh, distributed over all the editors uh, and over time, how can you visualize it and analyze it over time and see how the article actually developed. So let's Give, I'm going to give you the idea where this came from. I mean, the idea is that you know probably this uh, wealth distribution um, pie, pie or bar, char, bar charts. So that bottom 80% of the population, this is from the 2007 in the US, uh, is only only 7% of the financial, financial wealth. The top 1% of the population owns 42%. This is quite a common distribution in most economies, um, sadly. So. In economy, this is one problem. You can have also in this kind of chart. And I ask myself, is this also a problem in Wikipedia? So this looks weird. Okay. Um, so who, who and how many people did actually contribute to the content? Like the words that are in the article or in, the in a specific revision, how many people actually wrote this? What you can read there. Um, so what percentage of editors owns or authored what percentage of words? So it's similar to what we've seen with, with income, just with the words. So do we have uh, just a couple of editors that wrote most of the article, or a lot of article and, and a lot of uh, people that wrote just a little bit, or is it equally distributed? So that was the idea. Now the question is, of course, why would that be relevant? Probably a nice statistic, but why is it relevant? So um, I start you off with the motivation. The motivation was that there's a connection to quality, actually, in this concentration measure. Um, Afterwards, I'm going to talk about how we went about detecting the authorship, actually, because this is the databases for make, doing a concentration measure, um, which measure we actually used, and which, how we constructed the tool out of that, and um, what were the first observations or results before I conclude. So the goal in every article is to create and maintain quality and neutrality. Neutrality can be seen as a a facet of quality, but we're not going to talk about, discuss about that. Um, so the task for every, for the editors in this article is to include all relevant facts, sources, in forms of references and viewpoints, writing it in a neutral tone, creating a balanced representative article. That's the task. So we ask ourselves, who is better suited to solve the task, to accomplish the task? A lot of it, like if you have just a couple of editors that write most of the article, or if you have a lot of editors write the article and like, contribute a lot to the actually contributing to the article. And our hypothesis is that it's more probable if you have a lot of our editors. It's not that impossible or improbable if you have, because there are articles that are written actually by just a couple of editors. They're quite good. The thing is to be really neutral, to include every uh, fact, every, every reference, every viewpoint in a representative way, people would have to, to go over their own, um, they would actually have to transcend their own personal views. They would have to transcend their own personal biases. And it's more probable if you have a lot of people that are probably biased, maybe, but they would balance each other out with the information they have, with the biases they have, with the viewpoints they have. So this is the hypothesis. And I can already say that we're not going to prove this here, but this was the motivation to build this measure. Okay. This is a part of future work to prove this hypothesis, actually, but it's why we did it. That was the first uh, motivation. And it's also done in the render project that Danny talked about uh, earlier. 
that also uh, Enrique is involved in, together with Wikimedia Germany, uh, with Angelica Adam and Kai Nissen, that are also here. Um, and will be part, the tool that is actually coming out of that is will be part of the render toolkit. It's a knowledge diversity toolkit for Wikipedia where we add tools like this. We already have some tools. If you want to check it out, uh, you can just search for render toolkit. So the first task to do this, what, what we want to do, this concentration of authorship, is to actually detect authorship. So who wrote which words? Um, this is from another tool I'm going to talk about in a second uh, from Wikipraise. Um, so the, two, the, the, actual, um, the actual task is, you know, kind of, you know, if you don't see the mark up here, you cannot see the mark up here because, so you get a mark up here, for example, you can say these words and these words and these words were all written in this revision, this specific revision, and but then it's easy to uh, infer that it's written by this editor and at this date. Um, that's the actual task. So find the revision ID where a target word was introduced to the article for the first time. And for the first time, it's in this sense important because you know there's a lot of vandalism and reverting. So when I write something, there's a vandalism, vandalist blanking the page and then he reintroduces my words. I still want it to be my words. Yeah? I still want to detect it as my words, not as Danny's words. So that's uh, why I added for the first time here. Um, so there's some state of the art. The oldest uh, approach to this was Wikiflow, uh, history flow from IBM. They operated on sentences actually, so if you, if you change the comma, you would own or, or have authored the whole sentence. Um, this was a little bit too crude for us. And also you could not re detect reintroduction of text. There are some minor tools also in Wikipedia or that are not in the academic corner. So, like, I think there's a one script that's called Hauptautoren uh, in the German Wikipedia. But it's actually not there's no papers about it and there's no really evaluation of how they work. So our benchmark was Wikitrust. I don't know how many people of you know Wikitrust. Okay, yeah, like half of you. So Wikitrust actually uh, computes words uh, for, for words or um, sentences in a text, uh, a trust value, and all this really nice tool. And all this is um, based on who wrote which words because the authors actually inherit their trust to words. It's based on a long, a longest common word sequence approach. Um, it's a greedy algorithm, lo quite local. So there are some misinterpretations when words are moved. And there's also one error that the, ref the reference section is already attributed to the, to the editor that actually did not write the references, but inserted the template for the references. And so there's no proper evaluation of how accurate they actually are. They did not do it themselves, but the preliminary evaluation we did came about 50%, which we saw was not that good. So what we did, we, we developed our own approach to detecting this stuff, that this works. I'm not going to go in total detail here because I don't want to be that technical, but actually we're building article trees. So you see on the right side, this is the, the recent revision, and this is the last revision that we compared to. Yeah? So we split up the article. So the A you see here is the article itself. Then we, have, we split up in paragraphs, the whole text, and the paragraphs are split up in sentences. Yeah? Then we assign unique hash values, unique IDs, to uh, all of these nodes in our tree. And then we check what has actually changed. So you see here, this paragraph has the exact hash than before. So we can, uh, we can assume that it's the same paragraph. So we just, we don't do anything with it. We just uh, take the, 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 word the words that were attributed to different revision IDs or authors and just copy it to this uh, revision. The same here, it's the same uh, paragraph with the same sentences than before, same hash value. And here, for example, only one sentence is the same. So we copy it over. So in this way, we get rid of all things that were not changed. So, to, to, so we actually only have to do a computation on the actual words that were changed, on the sentences that did not match anything. And on, you can ask me later how exactly we do it, but we, we, we um, uh, use similarity measures to say this is the same sentence as this in the old revision, this is the same sentence as this in the old revision, and this sentence was not there before. And for the sentences that were supposedly the same, we make a text difference, uh, computer text difference, to see which words were actually removed or added. So we can say here there's a word added, here's a word added, and here's a whole sentence with, with a couple of words added, so all of these new words get attributed to the author or revision ID of this revision. 
You know, this is the one thing that, ed that I wrote, so I'm now the, the, the author of this word, this word, and all the words in this sentence. You can ask me about how it works uh, in the question set or in the paper. Um, also, another um, advantage is we all not only compare these hashes, like if they have been, the, these paragraphs and sentences have there bef been before for this revision, the last one, but for all revisions. So if, if, it, if they were deleted at one point and re reintroduced, yeah, the paragraph that Danny wrote 20 revisions ago was reintroduced now after a lot of vandalism, it's also detected here, with, together with the information that Danny wrote it. So then we did an evaluation of the accuracy comparing Wikitrust and our approach. It's not that big, but uh, it's still a significant. So 250 words from 45 randomly sampled articles, also randomly selected, and manually went through it and compared what both algorithms said where the word come, came from and if it's actually true. So the result is that Wikitrust is actually only correct in 48.4% uh, of the cases and we are correct in more than 10%, uh, more accuracy, and this is significant, very significant. Um, two things about that. First thing is I was kind of shocked that, that it's that low in the first place with Wikitrust because Wikitrust, this is what the data that Wikitrust really re relies on. It's the core data that, where they compute everything from. The second thing is we are not that, we are better, a lot better, but not that good either. Um, we already identified First thing, we already identified common mistakes that are made and we're currently uh, on the, uh, in, in the face of fixing them. And the second thing, it does not really affect our, uh, our measure that we put out in the end. So I'm going to talk about this in a second. So for the end measure that we do, the coefficient we compute is not that uh, uh, relevant. I will tell you about that later. So now we have the data. It was the part about the data. So now we have data that's more accurate than before. It's, it's kind of accurate, but still we know who wrote what. Now the question, a different question now, apart from that, is how to visualize, how to show it, how to make use of this data. So we have the Wikipraise, which is an is a add-on on the Wikitrust data. What they do, you've already seen that, to show you how, what, who authored which, uh, you can install it, and then you have this nice add-on in your browser, in the Wikipedia pages, where you can actually see who wrote what. You can have the rank list in each revision that you go to where you can see uh, here's the most, these are the, is the rank who wrote the most. The thing is, if you want to know how now, what is the concentration actually, what's the, is it really that unequal? Then you would go, you would have to go to each, every, uh, each and every editor and look it up, like mouse over it, see how many words they have written, then make your own history, uh, like your own histogram or something like that. Um, and you can only do this for, for this revision, and if you want to know it over time, you would have to do it for every revision. So it's quite impractical for this, apart from, this, from, the, from the fact that it's based on the Wikitrust uh, data. So we said we need an aggregated measure that's more intuitive, and it also can be used as a feature of an article, as a number. Okay? So what we're using is the Gini coefficient. It's pretty well known, pretty standard in uh, in economics, um, to measure inequality, so you don't have to look at the you don't have to look at the at the formula. What's important is it's based on a Lorentz curve. So yeah, here on the on the y-axis you have the cumulative percentage of income. I'm staying in the economy example. Here you have the um, cumul cumulative percentage of uh, of population, and in an equal, totally equal uh, society, like where everybody earns exactly the same. 25% of people would earn 25% of the income, 50% would earn 50% of the income, 75% would earn 75%. So everybody would earn the same. This is the line of equality. What actually happens is that the first 25 only have 5%, the next 25 have only 10% of the income, the next 25 have other 74 have only have uh, as then 15% of the income, so 30 in total here for, for these 75% of the population. And the rest of the 25 has actually 70% of the income, so it's pretty, so it's pretty unequal. So, this, 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 what this coefficient actually measures is this area here. So, how far you are away from total equality, and it, it normalizes it to, to this interval between zero and one. So, zero is total equality, and one is total inequality. One would be something like here, going up here. So this is a measure, and you can do the same for words in a Wikipedia article, actually. 
So we compute how many people, authors own how many percent of the words. And the tool actually, what happened here? Uh, I lost some of my graphics here. So what we have to do actually, we just have to put it into a graphical interface. We used uh, a solution from highcharts.com, which is pretty, pretty neat. Um, let me do it here. Is that possible to see? Yeah. Okay, so you can actually um, select an article that's preloaded here. You can select what you want to have on the, on the x-axis. So if you want to have revision ID or date, um, then you can actually, um, we, page, uh, we, we uh, divide it into pages so it loads faster. So you can see here, this is, uh, this is actually with uh, revision ID numbers that are equidistantly spaced. Um, you see how the uh, coefficient evolves over time. This is the beginning of the article. Then you can go about looking at this. And when you see something interesting, you can actually zoom into it, look further in it. And if you mouse over these, these dots, so the different revisions here, you can see the revision ID and the Gini index or Gini coefficient. And you could go, for example, to the history and look up what happened there, actually. Yeah, why did it go up all the way? Um, so this is the tool. Um, there are some other um, alternative approaches. I did not talk about them now. For example, that we also implemented. They're not so different from the actual curve uh, from the original uh, algorithm. Levenstein, for instance, for example, it ignores words um, that were only changed by two characters or one character. So when I make a spelling correction to Denny, I, it's not my word afterwards. Yeah, if I, if I, for example, collect a plural that he wrote, it's, it's apples, and I just delete the S, it would not be my word afterwards, it would still be his. So this is a different approach, or one where we actually use uh, filtered out stop words. Um, so not, or, and are not uh, are ignored, because they're not really carrying that much sense, it's just for comparison. But actually, the, the curves differ in height, but they don't really differ in, in, the, in the jumps that they do, they make. The same goes for the, for the inaccuracies that I talked about earlier. Um, we, we tested, because I said we have 60% accuracy, we tested it, we inserted random mistakes into the curve, and the curve did, did change in level a little bit, but it did not actually change in the jumps or in the, in the uh, so that much. So it's not really that much of an issue, as far as we know. Um, let me go back. Let me go back, so I don't need that. Ah, okay, I didn't show that. Um, you can also click on, there's a link for the latest revision. We also have, like wiki praise, we have an overview of, the, but on the wiki syntax, where you can go through the syntax, hover over words, and see who wrote them. So it's essentially the same as I showed before, just not that super neat. <laughs> We're still working on that. Um, so some first observations. I mean, this is not, this is not really like uh, representative, but we, I looked through a lot of articles. And actually, what you could see is so this is the, this is the beginning of Sergei Korolev and Barack Obama, and on the x-axis we have uh, the revision numbers. What you can see is that many articles actually stabilize after. So first of all, first of all, of course, in the beginning you always have an equality measure of one because one editor writes everything in the first revision. Of course, not possible there. So then comes another editor and uh, it uh, writes here, here, the second editor wrote more words, so it's more, it's less than equal. Yeah? Here, the, the second editor wrote not, did not add so much or delete from the first editor, so it's not, go, just does not go down that much. What you can actually see is that between 50 and 100, 150 edits, usually the curve stabilizes, stabilizes, yeah, stabilizes. So, that's an interesting um, observation. Then you can also observe that sometimes it stabilizes, really stabilizes, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it stays more volatile, like in this case. And when you look, for example, when you compare these two articles, you can actually see that Sergei Korolev was not that disputed. I mean, people are not really discussing a lot about it. There were, were not many reverts almost none, so people are actually, so someone built up this article to this phase where it was like that, and then people start contributing, and you can see the more words were contributed by more different people, it goes down a little bit all over, and it, this, this continues quite a, quite a long time. Where in Barack Obama, you can see there were some, 
discussions, some, some people deleted others. And that's really interesting about this coefficient. You don't have to, I mean, it also changes if, if, if words get deleted by someone, yeah? By someone who is a very strong editor, wrote a lot of words, someone deletes his edit, his words, then the coefficient goes down because the, relatively the weight of the other words by other editors goes up. Um, so, what you see here, these spikes, they are actually uh, vandalism, they're blanking vandalism, so it's not a new method to, to detect vandalism, but it gives a nice overview about blanking vandalism, yeah? Because when you have someone blanks the page, or blanks it almost, yeah, then it goes up and down very much because then it's, there's only one editor uh, owning most of the words or no editor. Um, what you can also see is that is what you can also see is that um, uh, over time, when, when I when I choose dates as a as a x, uh, x axis, you can actually see that this took a little longer here uh, uh, to stabilize for Sergei Korolev than it did for Barack Obama. Yeah. It's just because Barack Obama did receive more edits in shorter time. But it's also it's an interesting thing to, to look at. Um, here in Barack Obama we see that there's actually a step up in the curve. Uh, so these things are interesting. i give you another example uh, of Antarctica. Um, this is really interesting. Um, so we had here one editor that in the, po in the course of I think one or one and a half days actually edits a lot of words, added, um, he deleted some, uh, shifted some, uh, but mainly really adding uh, uh, whole sections. And um, there was only two edits actually that, that did, I think, two uh, comma mistakes, but it was not disputed at all. So there, was no, there were no reverts, there was, not, there was not even something on the talk page. There was nobody really, this was in 2006, so that's not, maybe not that uncommon in that time. Today it would be probably different. But there was actually no discussion whatsoever about what he did. Um, so he actually constructed most of the article. And what's interesting, and you see afterwards, this decreases slowly, like we see with Sergei Korolev. But actually, there's not there, not at one point where it drops again, where his content gets removed again. So and still today, he's the top second. He's the second top editor in words uh, in Wikipedia, and most of his sections st are still in place, like they were in 2006. One section on meteor meteorites is he was it was split out as a own section, but the words are still this of him, all the words. So this is actually interesting because you can see that whether he's a really really good editor that that uh, could could uh, predict what was relevant that good, or people did not dare to change actually what was in there. That's not for me to decide. I'm just saying that it's really in interesting indicators of of what hap what's happening there. Um, you could argue in this sense, you could also detect that with uh, if the, like the number of characters goes up, because he added a lot. But the, the thing is, uh, you can, uh, this, this, this would also go up if you would delete a lot, or if you would delete and add. And this happens as well, I mean, people deleting a whole section and writing it new. You would, not delete, you would not detect that if you only look at characters going up or down, like the length of the article, but you will detect that with this coefficient. Um, Okay, let's skip this article. So this is a nice. So to conclude, so this low concentration better for quality. But I, I said that we don't didn't test that here, uh, and we still don't know what other information we can derive from that because we only did this first observations. But what we did, we we, we raised the accuracy, and we have a good idea how we can rate it further. Um, and this tool is really helpful just to to spot interesting, interesting uh, uh, evolu evolutionary steps in this article, uh, to look at them. They don't necessarily mean something bad, but it's interesting to combine them with other measures, for example, in this toolkit that we have, uh, and that's what we are planning actually, um, to combine them with more measures, like for example, edit concentration, reverts, the size of the article, and what I really want to do, the top 10 authors, you can see the line of the top 10 authors as well, um, and actually what turned out from my first observations and when I went through all this, the interesting information actually lies in the changes, not so much in the in the height of the of the con of the coefficient, because it is mostly between 0 0.7, 0 0.8, sometimes 0 0.9, but for most articles, it actually is quite high, if you would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have a nice some nice plans, and it's actually uh, right now uh, being implemented at the tool server. 
so and we try to then give timely accounts of, of the because right now we only have have it running on the dump and then we hope we can do it more like updated every every four weeks or two weeks or something like that um, and we're working on an add-on that's not as nice as wiki praise working on our data and there was a nice suggestion by someone at the web science this year who said it would be nice to have a list of all articles that recently got a very high coefficient to look at them. So that's things that we are probably working on, but I'm open to other suggestions. So thank you, and uh, any questions are welcome. So, uh, question. Uh, what have any data or is it your impression that certain edits done at certain times have less probability of being reverted? So if you do it after lunch, nobody will notice, or if you do it before lunch, somebody will notice? <laughs> um, mm, yes, I do, but this, I mean, not in the, the, I mean, did not look at that in this, um, in this work. I did not do research on that. But I do actually think that there is some probability going down when you when you uh, when you when you do it at night for specific articles that are very interesting for this population. So if you edit Barack Obama and it's night in the U.S., it's I think it's more probable to to not get reverted. Yes, but it's a personal. It's, uh, it's not really on, based on research. Do you also look at uh, articles uh, that have been split into uh, different ones where the content was outsourced? Uh, yes, and this is actually yes. I mean, this will also lead to um, to a decrease or an increase. So actually, it, it's not. That's why I say it, you have to look at what it means a step up or a step down. That's why I'm not asserting anything that it means something bad or good. Um, because of, of course, and it's actually you can use this to see when it when this happened. Because if you have a really really huge increase or decrease, that usually means decrease. Um, yeah, it depends on how the article actually looked before. You cannot say if it's a decrease or increase. So yeah, that could be a, actually you see steps up or steps down. Sometimes it is uh, outsourcing of the article. Can you see uh, how do you uh, splitting a sentence into two sentences. Uh, uh -huh. I have a backup slide for this. No, I don't. Oh, sorry, I didn't do it. Um, so actually, what I do, I look for the. I start with the first sentence, and if I don't find uh, similar, I do it by vectors and by by uh, by, by simple cosine similarity. And if I if I don't find it, usually if I would split out the sentence like. Say, let's say these two here were, were one sentence before, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, like, were this sentence before, and I, someone split them up into two sentences. Then I look with cosine, so I look for the vector of words, and if, and if they don't cross a certain threshold, I will assume this is a new sentence. So this is, a, this is an error you could, do, uh, you could make in the way, then you, but then you know, so, so this, if this is this, these two are just this sentence split it. Mm -hmm. Then I would, and it depends if they're if this one sentence is still similar enough to be recognized as, as the same sentence here. I would recognize this sentence as the same as here, but this sentence as new. Okay. Okay, because I, I set a certain threshold in a cosine similarity, and if it goes over, it's the same sentence. If it stays under, it's a, it's not the same sentence. Then you have to ask yourself, is this really a mistake? Because if I build a completely two new sentences of one sentence, is it actually something new or is it something old? But I cannot answer this, actually. Yeah, there are many very complex sentences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also the same with you split the par one paragraph into two. Uh, yes, that would be the same. Then you would start, then you would just have more work because then you would not recognize, oh, I don't have it here. Then you would not recognize the paragraph as the same because it would not say have the same hash value, and then you would actually have to compare all the sentences. But in a, in, in a way, in a case where it's only split, it, you would still find the same sentences in these paragraphs. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, 
Uh, uh, first of all, thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. You know that uh, I think that your contributions have, have been quite interesting so far. I encourage you to, to follow up with the good work. So uh, I have uh, one question and a few suggestions. So first of all, can you go uh, forward, actually backward to the first slide of your conclusions? Of my conclusions? Yeah. Uh. Uh, yeah, that one. So, uh, so your uh, preliminary hypothesis is local co concentration is better for quality still to be tested. Actually, what you have presented today is that most of uh, if I if I got it right, is that most of the for most of the articles, uh, the inequality level is somewhat high. I mean, between. 75 percent to, to uh, yeah, it's not, yeah it's, it's not percent, but yeah. Okay. okay, and actually it remains stable over time, which is consistent with my own work about the Gini coefficient and the, the inequality of uh, contributions to the better the macroscopic level for different languages. So the question is, so given that the empirical evidence is that the uh, actually is, uh, 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 is that the uh, negative contributions to articles are actually highly unequal. Uh, so, how does it uh, fit with this uh, kind of uh, initial hypothesis? I don't think it contradicts it. I mean, it could be well be that this... I mean, first of all, okay, two, two answers to this question. First of all, I think it's relative. So, first of all, I think you have to relate articles. So, I think if one has a bigger concentration, and this could also be... I mean, it's a... It's not... I mean, you have to interpret this, this coefficient. It goes up very quickly. Um, well, it depends on, depends on the number of the, the, yeah. of the population. And also depends on, actually we did not filter out vandalism. For example, it goes up quite quickly if you, for example, there is, there is vandalism revert, vandalism revert. This means that coefficient will go up even if, the, even if the number of authors to words is the same because the number of edits just increases tremendously because there's a lot of vandalism. It does not actually mean that that the, that the article is more concentrated than the other one who did not have vandalism. So this is one thing that has to be uh, taken into account. Then I would always compare two articles. Like, is it more, is it more concentrated or less? The sec second answer to that is, um, actually it can be that it's, it's not contradicting the hypothesis. I don't think so, because actually it could be that, that it is, that it is uh, not really, really, uh, diverse. So I cannot say anything about that because actually we don't know, it, it could just, just be that many articles in Wikipedia are hardly undiverse because there are not many people contributing to them. So I, I don't think it's actually uh, contradicting my hypothesis at this point. Mm -hmm. So uh, the um, second point is, uh, can you go backwards to the, the difference in accuracy with Wikipedia? Uh, the, the evaluation? Yeah, the evaluation. Right, here we go. That one. So, uh, so uh, actually what I'm missing here is how many revisions are you uh, considering? Because you say uh, 250 words, uh, 45 random sample articles, but how many revisions? Only one. Uh, only the last one. Only the last one. Okay. Yeah, I just took the last one from these 45. Uh -huh. And from these revisions of the 45, I selected randomly 250 words. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it actually I, I should not matter if, you, if I had to take different revisions from this one or two articles and go back in time, because this should be right over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, the final quick assessment is uh, I'm probably missing one important uh, input, uh, which is the experience of the user. Uh -huh. Uh, I mean, if you go the other way around, so if you get quality content that has been marked as, as such by the community, good articles, future articles, for instance, mm -hmm. you go backwards to see who has been contributed to those articles. What you find out is that most of the people, uh, high proportion, like 80%, 90%, yeah. uh, are experienced users with more than 1,000 days of uh, mm -hmm. presence in Wikipedia with uh, uh, continued activity in Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm wondering if uh, that could be uh, an improvement to the model for trying to predict somehow the, the uh, quality of the articles with this, this uh, kind of approach.
to introduce that, that kind of covariate. And for instance, trying to get a, a, a sample data set and then a validation data set to try to, to correlate that. Pretty sure that is very, that would be a very good add on to this. As I said before, this is, was never thought as a standalone measure for anything. Mm -hmm. I would never assume that only authorship concentration says anything about article quality. I would assume that you can use it as an indicator. Um, so probably experience of editors would be very nice to have as well. I mean, actually all these kind of things in one really nice tool would be the best thing to have. Like experience of editors, like what is the average, what is the average experience of the top 10 contributors, for example, or something like this. Um, if, if you could have that in the curve or in the tool to have an overview, it would be actually really nice. Let me see what. And all these kind of things, edit concentration, reverts, uh, experience, the size, the top and out authors, all of these things. Actually, all of these things together, I, I, I guess, would be a really nice overview tool to see what's happening with this article. I, I, I really, really not recommend anyone to take only one of these things to, to predict anything. It's, too much too, it's much too complex. Repeat it. Do you plan to provide an API? So in the future, <laughs> I would. Trust? I would like to. Yes. Um, I don't. But I cannot promise anything, actually. So get somehow included in. Yes. I. I, would, I mean, this. 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 So this get somehow included in the render project, and then it's. I cannot tell. I mean. Okay, uh, we are we're actually going to put it on a tool server and I, I would really like to have an API but I cannot say if we can do that from the KIT or if Wikimedia will take over it. I have to talk to Kai and uh, Kai Nissen and Angelica and let's see what we can do. But if we can I just checked out your website and you did this calculation just for a couple of articles. So uh, do you plan to have like a service where you can put any article you want? Uh, and to calculate this measure? That's what we want to do. We had <laughs> what we had first is a download thing. So we thinking you could specify any article that you wanted, but then you would. It was a little bit of a security breach because then everybody could just enter all of the articles that were downloaded from Wikipedia because we did not operate on the dump because for that you would have to search for the article in the dump. It would take even longer. Mm -hmm. um, what we're doing, trying to do right now, is to calculate a set of interesting articles every four weeks or two weeks or so and provide it on the site and you can actually recommend what you want to have there and we will include it in the next calculation. Because on the fly it's, it t just takes too long because right now we're not that fast and to search through the whole dump and look for it, probably the user would, get, would interrupt the process because it's taking too long. So that's what we're pl planning to do. The code should be on my website, I need to have to check. So if someone wants to if take not, it, I will put it on there. So if someone wants to take it and make it so it's a And actually we, have, actually we have a good idea of what is going wrong there. I mean, most of the, most of the, most of the errors actually made by, these, by both of these approaches are, let me go, uh, I don't have it here. Most of, anyway, most of the errors are made that are the words are not even introduced into, into this revision, not that it's not the first word or it's not the exact word, but the simple fact that it's not even added in the diff, when you look at the diff in Wikipedia, it's not even added, added there. And for our, what I see so far is that it's mostly um, a problem of delimiters, where words end, where words start, because we also take into account the, the syntax and there are many words that are clutched, like put together with, with some, some extra characters with HTML code, with syntax code with everything and you cannot really just tell apart the sentences and the words. Mm -hmm. That's actually, and we're working on that and it should not be that much of a problem to increase accuracy a lot. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again.